The Stolen Body by H. G. Wells. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. The Stolen Body. Mr. Bessel was a senior partner in the firm of Bessel, Hart and Brown of St. Paul's Churchyard, and for many years he was well known among those interested in psychical research as a liberal-minded and conscientious investigator. He was an unmarried man, and instead of living in the suburbs after the fashion of his class, he occupied rooms in the Albany near Piccadilly. He was particularly interested in the questions of thought transference and of apparitions of the living, and in November 1896 he commenced a series of experiments in conjunction with Mr. Vincey of Staple Inn in order to test the alleged possibility of projecting an apparition of one's self by force of will through space. Their experiments were conducted in the following manner. At a prearranged hour, Mr. Bessel shut himself in one of his rooms in the Albany and Mr. Vincey in his sitting room in Staple Inn and each then fixed his mind as resolutely as possible on the other. Mr. Bessel had acquired the art of self-hypnotism, and, so far as he could, he attempted first to hypnotize himself, and then to project himself as a phantom of the living across the intervening space of nearly two miles into Mr. Vincey's apartment. On several evenings this was tried without any satisfactory result, but on the fifth or sixth occasion, Mr. Vincey did actually see or imagine he saw an apparition of Mr. Bessel standing in his room. He states that the appearance, although brief, was very vivid and real. He noticed that Mr. Bessel's face was white and his expression anxious, and moreover, that his hair was disordered. For a moment, Mr. Vincey, in spite of his state of expectation, was too surprised to speak or move and in that moment it seemed to him as though the figure glanced over its shoulder and incontinently vanished. It had been arranged that an attempt should be made to photograph any phantasm scene, but Mr. Vincey had not the instant presence of mind to snap the camera that lay ready on the table beside him, and when he did so he was too late. Greatly elated, however, even by this partial success, he made a note of the exact time and at once took a cab to the Albany to inform Mr. Bessel of this result. He was surprised to find Mr. Bessel's outer door standing open to the night, and the inner apartments lit and in an extraordinary disorder. An empty champagne magnum lay smashed upon the floor, its neck had been broken off against the inkpot on the bureau, and lay beside it. An octagonal occasional table, which carried a bronze statuette and a number of choice books, had been rudely overturned and down the primrose paper of the wall inky fingers had been drawn, as it seemed for the mere pleasure of defilement. One of the delicate chintz curtains had been violently torn from its rings and thrust upon the fire, so that the smell of its smouldering filled the room. Indeed, the whole place was disarranged in the strangest fashion. For a few minutes Mr. Vincey, who had entered sure of finding Mr. Bessel in his easy chair awaiting him, could scarcely believe his eyes, and stood staring helplessly at these unanticipated things. Then, full of a vague sense of calamity, he sought the porter at the entrance lodge. "'Where is Mr. Bessel?' he asked. "'Do you know that all the furniture is broken in Mr. Bessel's room?' The porter said nothing, but obeying his gesture, came at once to Mr. Bessel's apartment to see the state of affairs. "'This settles it,' he said, surveying the lunatic confusion. I didn't know of this. Mr. Bessel's gone off. He's mad. He then proceeded to tell Mr. Vincey that about half an hour previously, that is to say, at about the time of Mr. Bessel's apparition in Mr. Vincey's rooms, the missing gentleman had rushed out of the gates of the Albany into Vigo Street, hatless and with disordered hair, and had vanished into the direction of Bond Street. And as he went past me, said the porter, he laughed, a sort of gasping laugh with his mouth open and his eyes glaring. I tell you, sir, he face scared me, like this. According to his imitation, it was anything but a pleasant laugh. He waved his hand with all his fingers crooked and clawing like that, and he said in a sort of fierce whisper, Life! Just that one word, life! Dear me, said Mr. Vincey, tut-tut, and dear me.
He could think of nothing else to say. He was naturally very much surprised. He turned from the room to the porter, and from the porter to the room in the gravest perplexity. Beyond his suggestion that probably Mr. Bessel would come back presently and explain what had happened, their conversation was unable to proceed. It might be a sudden toothache, said the porter. A very sudden and violent toothache, jumping on him suddenly like, and driving him wild. I've broken things myself before now in such a case, he thought. If it was, why should he say life to me as he went past? Mr. Vincey did not know. Mr. Bessel did not return, and at last Mr. Vincey, having done some more helpless staring, and having addressed a note of brief inquiry, and left it in a conspicuous position on the bureau, returned in a very perplexed frame of mind to his own premises in Staple Inn. This affair had given him a shock. He was at a loss to account for Mr. Bessel's conduct on any sane hypothesis. He tried to read, but he could not do so. He went for a short walk, and was so preoccupied that he narrowly escaped a cab at the top of Chancery Lane and at last, a full hour before his usual time, he went to bed. For a considerable time he could not sleep, because of his memory of the silent confusion of Mr. Bessel's apartment, and when at length he did attain an uneasy slumber, it was at once disturbed by a very vivid and distressing dream of Mr. Bessel. He saw Mr. Bessel gesticulating wildly, and with his face white and contorted, and inexplicably mingled with his appearance, suggested perhaps by his gestures, was an intense fear, an urgency to act. He even believes that he heard the voice of his fellow experimenter calling distressfully to him, though at the time he considered this to be an illusion. The vivid impression remained, though Mr. Vincey awoke. For a space he lay awake and trembling in the darkness, possessed with that vague, unaccountable terror of unknown possibilities that comes out of dreams upon even the bravest men. But at last he roused himself and turned over and went to sleep again, only for the dream to return with enhanced vividness. He awoke with such a strong conviction that Mr. Bessel was in overwhelming distress and need of help that sleep was no longer possible. He was persuaded that his friend had rushed out to some dire calamity. For a time he lay reasoning vainly against this belief, but at last he gave way to it. He rose against all reason, lit his gas, and dressed, and set out through the deserted streets, deserted save for a noiseless policeman or so, and the early news carts, towards Vigo Street to inquire if Mr. Bessel had returned. But he never got there. As he was going down Long Acre, some unaccountable impulse turned him aside out of that street towards Covent Garden which was just waking to its nocturnal activities. He saw the market in front of him, a queer effect of glowing yellow lights and busy black figures. He became aware of a shouting, and perceived a figure turn the corner by the hotel and run swiftly towards him. He knew at once that it was Mr. Bessel. But it was Mr. Bessel transfigured. He was hatless and dishevelled, his collar was torn open, he grasped a bone-handled walking cane near the ferrule end, and his mouth was pulled awry. And he ran, with agile strides, very rapidly. Their encounter was the affair of an instant. Bessel! cried Vincey. The running man gave no sign of recognition, either of Mr. Vincey or of his own name. Instead, he cut at his friend savagely with a stick, hitting him in the face within an inch of the eye. Mr. Vincey, stunned and astonished, staggered back, lost his footing, and fell heavily on the pavement. It seemed to him that Mr. Bessel leapt over him as he fell. When he looked again, Mr. Bessel had vanished, and a policeman and a number of garden porters and salesmen were rushing past towards Long Acre in hot pursuit. With the assistance of several passers-by, for the whole street was speedily alive with running people, Mr. Vincey struggled to his feet. He at once became the centre of a crowd greedy to see his injury. A multitude of voices competed to reassure him of his safety, and then to tell him of the behaviour of the madman, as they regarded Mr. Bessel. He had suddenly appeared in the middle of the market, screaming, Life! Life! striking left and right with a blood-stained walking-stick, and dancing and shouting with laughter at each successful blow. A lad and two women had broken heads, and he had smashed a man's wrist, a little child had been knocked insensible, and for a time he had driven every one before him, so furious and resolute had his behaviour been.
Then he made a raid upon a coffee stall, hurled its paraffin flare through the window of the post office, and fled laughing, after stunning the foremost of the two policemen who had the pluck to charge him. Mr. Vincey's first impulse was naturally to join in the pursuit of his friend, in order, if possible, to save him from the violence of the indignant people. But his action was slow, the blow had half stunned him, and while this was still no more than a resolution, came the news, shouted through the crowd, that Mr. Bessel had eluded his pursuers. At first, Mr. Vincey could scarcely credit this. But the universality of the report, and presently the dignified return of two futile policemen, convinced him. After some aimless inquiries, he returned towards Staple Inn, padding a handkerchief to a now very painful nose. He was angry and astonished and perplexed. It appeared to him indisputable that Mr. Bessel must have gone violently mad in the midst of his experiment in thought transference, but why that he should make him appear with a sad white face in Mr. Vincey's dreams seemed a problem beyond solution. He racked his brains in vain to explain this. It seemed to him at last that not simply Mr. Bessel, but the order of things must be insane. But he could think of nothing to do. He shut himself carefully into his room, lit his fire, it was a gas fire with asbestos bricks, and fearing fresh dreams if he went to bed, remained bathing his injured face, or holding up books in a vain attempt to read until dawn. Throughout that vigil he had a curious persuasion that Mr. Bessel was endeavouring to speak to him, but he would not let himself attend to any such belief. About dawn his physical fatigue asserted itself, and he went to bed and slept at last in spite of dreaming. He rose late, unrested and anxious, and in considerable facial pain. The morning papers had no news of Mr. Bessel's aberration. It had come too late for them. Mr. Vincey's perplexities, to which the fever of his bruise added fresh irritation, became at last intolerable, and after a fruitless visit to the Albany, he went down to St. Paul's churchyard to Mr. Hart, Mr. Bessel's partner, and so far as Mr. Vincey knew, his nearest friend. He was surprised to learn that Mr. Hart, although he knew nothing of the outbreak, had also been disturbed by a vision, the very vision that Mr. Vincey had seen. Mr. Bessel, white and dishevelled, pleading earnestly by his gestures for help. That was his impression of the import of his signs. "'I was just going to look him up in the Albany when you arrived,' said Mr. Hart. "'I was so sure of something being wrong with him.' At the outcome of their consultation, the two gentlemen decided to inquire at Scotland Yard for news of their missing friend. "'He is bound to be laid by the heels,' said Mr. Hart. "'He can't go on at that pace for long.' But the police authorities had not laid Mr. Bessel by the heels. They confirmed Mr. Vincey's overnight experiences and added fresh circumstances, some of an even graver character than those he knew. A list of smashed glass along the upper half of Tottenham Court Road, an attack upon a policeman in Hampstead Road, and an atrocious assault upon a woman. All these outrages were committed between half-past twelve and a quarter to two in the morning, and between those hours, and indeed from the very moment of Mr. Bessel's first rush from his room at half-past nine in the evening, they could trace the deepening violence of his fantastic career. For the last hour, at last, from before one, that is, until a quarter to two, he had run amuck through London, eluding with amazing agility every effort to stop or capture him. But after a quarter of two, he had vanished. Up to that hour, witnesses were multitudinous. Dozens of people had seen him, fled from him, or pursued him, and then things suddenly came to an end. At a quarter to two he had been seen running down the Euston Road towards Baker Street, flourishing a can of burning colza oil, and jerking splashes of flame therefrom at the windows of the houses he passed. But none of the policemen on Euston Road beyond the waxwork exhibition, nor any of those in the side streets down which he must have passed, had he left the Euston Road, had seen anything of him. Abruptly he disappeared. Nothing of his subsequent doings came to light in spite of the keenest inquiry. Here was a fresh astonishment for Mr. Vincey. He had found considerable comfort in Mr. Hart's conviction. He is bound to be laid by the heels before long, and in that assurance he had been able to suspend his mental perplexities. But any fresh development seemed destined to add new impossibilities to a pile already heaped beyond the powers of his acceptance. He found himself doubting whether his memory might not have played him some grotesque trick, debating whether any of these things could possibly have happened, 
and in the afternoon he hunted up Mr. Hart again to share the intolerable weight on his mind. He found Mr. Hart engaged with a well-known private detective, but as that gentleman accomplished nothing in this case, we need not enlarge upon his proceedings. All that day Mr. Bessel's whereabouts eluded an unceasingly active inquiry, and all that night, and all that day there was a persuasion in the back of Vincy's mind that Mr. Bessel sought his attention, and all through the night Mr. Bessel, with a tear-stained face of anguish, pursued him through his dreams. And whenever he saw Mr. Bessel in his dreams, he also saw a number of other faces, vague but malignant, that seemed to be pursuing Mr. Bessel. It was in the following day, Sunday, that Mr. Vincey recalled certain remarkable stories of Mrs. Bullock, the medium, who was then attracting attention for the first time in London. He determined to consult her. She was staying at the house of that well-known inquirer, Dr. Wilson Paget, and Mr. Vincey, although he had never met that gentleman before, repaired to him forthwith with the intention of invoking her help. But scarcely had he mentioned the name of Bessel when Dr. Paget interrupted him. Last night, just at the end, he said, we had a communication. He left the room and returned with a slate on which were certain words written in a handwriting, shaky indeed, but indisputably the handwriting of Mr. Bessel. How did you get this? said Mr. Vincey. Do you mean... We got it last night, said Dr. Paget. With numerous interruptions from Mr. Vincey, he proceeded to explain how the writing had been obtained. It appears that in her seances, Mrs. Bullock passes into the condition of trance, her eyes rolling up in a strange way under her eyelids, and her body becoming rigid. She then begins to talk very rapidly, usually in voices other than her own. At the same time, one or both of her hands may become active, and if slates and pencils are provided, they will then write messages simultaneously with and quite independently of the flow of words from her mouth. By many she is considered an even more remarkable medium than the celebrated Mrs. Piper. It was one of these messages, the one written by her left hand, that Mr. Vincey now had before him. It consisted of eight words written disconnectedly. George Bessel Trial ex cabin Baker Street Help! Starvation! Curiously enough, neither Dr. Paget nor the other two inquirers who were present had heard of the disappearance of Mr. Bessel. The news of it appeared only in the evening papers of Saturday, and they had put the message aside with many others of a vague and enigmatical sort that Mrs. Bullock had from time to time delivered. When Dr. Paget heard Mr. Vincey's story, he gave himself at once with great energy to the pursuit of this clue to the discovery of Mr. Bessel. It would serve no useful purpose here to describe the inquiries of Mr. Vincey and himself. Suffice it that the clue was a genuine one, and that Mr. Bessel was actually discovered by its aid. He was found at the bottom of a detached shaft, which had been sunk and abandoned at the commencement of the work for the new electric railway near Baker Street Station. His arm and leg and two ribs were broken. The shaft is protected by a hoarding nearly twenty feet high, and over this, incredible as it seems, Mr. Bessel, a stout middle-aged gentleman, must have scrambled in order to fall down the shaft. He was saturated in colza oil, and the smashed tin lay beside him. But luckily the flame had been extinguished by his fall, and his madness had passed from him altogether. But he was, of course, terribly enfeebled, and at the sight of his rescuers he gave way to hysterical weeping. In view of the deplorable state of his flat, he was taken to the house of Dr. Hatton in Upper Baker Street. Here he was subjected to a sedative treatment, and anything that might recall the violent crisis through which he had passed was carefully avoided. But on the second day he volunteered a statement. Since that occasion, Mr. Bessel has several times repeated the statement to myself among other people, varying the details as the narrator of real experience always does, but never by any chance contradicting himself in any particular. And the statement he makes is in substance as follows. In order to understand it clearly, it is necessary to go back to his experiments with Mr. Vincey before his remarkable attack. Mr. Bessel's first attempt at self-projection in his experiments with Mr. Vincey were, as a reader will remember, unsuccessful. But through all of them he was concentrating all his power and will upon getting out of the body, willing it with all my might, he says. At last, almost against expectation, came success and Mr. Bessel asserts that he, being alive, did actually, by an effort of will, 
leave his body and pass into some place or state outside this world. The release was, he asserts, instantaneous. At one moment I was seated in my chair with my eyes tightly shut, my hands gripping the arms of the chair, doing all I could to concentrate my mind on Vincy, and then I perceived myself outside my body, saw my body near me but certainly not containing me, with the hands relaxing and the head drooping forward on the breast. Nothing shakes him in this assurance of that release. He describes in a quiet matter-of-fact way the new sensation he experienced. He felt he had become impalpable, so much he had expected, but he had not expected to find himself enormously large. So, however, it would seem he became. I was a great cloud, if I may express it that way, anchored to my body. It appeared to me at first as if I had discovered a great self of which the conscious being in my brain was only a little part. I saw the Albany and Piccadilly and Regent Street and all the rooms and places in the houses, very minute and very bright and distinct, spread out below me like a little city seen from a balloon. Every now and then vague shapes like drifting reeds of smoke made the vision a little indistinct, but at first I paid little heed to them. The thing that astonished me most, and which astonishes me still, is that I saw quite distinctly the insides of the houses as well as the streets, saw little people dining and talking in the private houses, men and women dining, playing billiards, and drinking in restaurants and hotels, and several places of entertainment crammed with people. It was like watching the affairs of a glass hive. Such were Mr. Bessel's exact words as I took them down when he told me the story. Quite forgetful of Mr. Vincy, he remained for a space observing these things. Impelled by curiosity, he says, he stooped down and with a shadowy arm he found himself possessed of, attempted to touch a man walking along Vigo Street. But he could not do so since his finger seemed to pass through the man. Something prevented his doing this, but what it was he finds it hard to describe. He compares the obstacle to a sheet of glass. I felt as a kitten may feel, he said when it goes for the first time to pat its reflection in a mirror. Again and again, on the occasion when I heard him tell the story, Mr. Bessel returned to that comparison of the sheet of glass. Yet it was not altogether a precise comparison, because, as the reader will speedily see, there were interruptions of this generally impermeable resistance, means of getting through the barrier to the material world again. But naturally, there is a very great difficulty in expressing these unprecedented impressions in the language of everyday experience. A thing that impressed him instantly and which weighed upon him throughout all his experience was the stillness of this place. He was in a world without sound. At first Mr. Bessel's mental state was an unemotional wonder. His thought chiefly concerned itself with where he might be. He was out of the body, out of his material body at any rate, but that was not all. He believes, and I for one believe also, that he was somewhere out of space, as we understand it altogether. By a strenuous effort of will, he had passed out of his body into a world beyond this world, a world undreamt of, yet lying so close to it and so strangely situated with regard to it that all things on this earth are clearly visible, both from without and from within, in this other world about us. For a long time, as it seemed to him, this realization occupied his mind to the exclusion of all other matters, and then he recalled the engagement with Mr. Vincey, to which this astonishing experience was, after all, but a prelude. He turned his mind to locomotion in this new body in which he found himself. For a time he was unable to shift himself from his attachment to this earthly carcass. For a time this new strange cloud body of his simply swayed, contracted, expanded, coiled and writhed with his efforts to free himself. And then quite suddenly the link that bound him snapped. For a moment everything was hidden by what appeared to be whirling spheres of dark vapour, and then, through a momentary gap, he saw his drooping body collapse limply. He saw his lifeless head drop sideways, and found he was driving along like a huge cloud in a strange place of shadowy clouds that had the luminous intricacy of London spread like a model below. But now he was aware that the fluctuating vapour about him was something more than vapour, and the temerarious excitement of his first essay was shot with fear. For he perceived, at first indistinctly, and then suddenly very clearly, that he was surrounded by faces, that each roll and coil of the seeming cloud stuff was a face, 
and such faces, faces of thin shadow, faces of gaseous tenuity, faces like those faces that glare with intolerable strangeness upon the sleeper in the evil hours of his dreams, evil, greedy eyes that were full of covetous curiosity, faces with knit brows and snarling, smiling lips, their vague hands clutched at Mr. Bessel as he passed, and the rest of their bodies was but an elusive streak of trailing darkness. Never a word, they said, never a sound from the mouths that seemed to gibber. All about him they pressed in that dreamy silence, passing freely through the dim mistiness that was his body, gathering even more numerously about him, and the shadowy Mr. Bessel, now suddenly fear-stricken, drove through the silent, active multitude of eyes and clutching hands. So inhuman were their faces, so malignant their staring eyes and shadowy, clawing gestures, that it did not occur to Mr. Bessel to attempt intercourse with these drifting creatures. Idiot phantoms they seemed, children of vain desire, beings unborn and forbidden, the boon of being, whose only expressions and gestures told of the envy and craving for life that was their one link with existence. It says much for his resolution that, amidst the swarming cloud of these noiseless spirits of evil, he could still think of Mr. Vincey. He made a violent effort of will and found himself, he knew not how, stooping towards Staple Inn, saw Vincey sitting attentive and alert in his armchair by the fire, and clustering also about him, as they clustered ever about all that lives and breathes, was another multitude of these vain voiceless shadows, longing, desiring, seeking some loophole into life. For a space Mr. Bessel sought ineffectually to attract his friend's attention. He tried to get in front of his eyes, to move the objects in his room, to touch him. But Mr. Vincey remained unaffected, ignorant of the being that was so close to his own. The strange something that Mr. Bessel had compared to a sheet of glass separated them impermeably. And at last Mr. Bessel did a desperate thing. I have told how that in some strange way he could see not only the outside of a man as we see him, but within. He extended his shadowy hand and thrust his vague black fingers, as it seemed, through the heedless brain. Then suddenly Mr. Vincey started like a man who recalls his attention from wandering thoughts, and it seemed to Mr. Bessel that a little dark red body situated in the middle of Mr. Vincey's brain swelled and glowed as he did so. Since that experience he has been shown anatomical figures of the brain and he knows now that this is for that useless structure, as doctors call it, the pineal eye. For, strange as it will seem to many, we have, a deep in our brains, where it cannot possibly see any earthly light, an eye. At the time, this with the rest of the internal anatomy of the brain was quite new to him. At the sight of its changed appearance, however, he thrust forth his finger, and rather fearful still of the consequences, touched this little spot. And instantly Mr. Vincey started, and Mr. Bessel knew that he was seen. And at that instant it came to Mr. Bessel that evil had happened to his body, and behold, a great wind blew through all that world of shadows and tore him away. So strong was this persuasion that he thought no more of Mr. Vincey, but turned about forthwith, and all the countless faces drove back with him like leaves before a gale. But he returned too late. In an instant he saw the body that he had left inert and collapsed, lying indeed like the body of a man just dead, had arisen, and arisen by virtue of some strength and will beyond his own. It stood with staring eyes, stretching its limbs in dubious fashion. For a moment he watched it in wild dismay, and then he stooped towards it. But the pane of glass had closed against him again, and he was foiled. He beat himself passionately against this, and all about him the spirits of evil grinned and pointed and mocked. He gave way to furious anger. He compares himself to a bird that had fluttered needlessly into a room, and is beating at the window-pane that holds it back from freedom. And behold, the little body that had once been his was now dancing with delight. He saw it shouting, though he could not hear its shouts, he saw the violence of its movements grow. He watched it fling his cherished furniture about in the mad delight of existence, rend his books apart, smash bottles, drink heedlessly from the jagged fragments, leap and smite in a passionate acceptance of living. He watched these actions in paralyzed astonishment. Then once more he hurled himself against the impossible barrier, and then with all that crew of mocking ghosts about him, hurried back in dire confusion to Vincey to tell him of the outrage that had come upon him. 
but the brain of Vincy was now closed against apparitions, and the disembodied Mr. Bessel pursued him in vain as he hurried out into Holborn to call a cab. Foiled and terror-stricken, Mr. Bessel swept back again to find his desecrated body whooping in a glorious frenzy down the Burlington Arcade. And now the attentive reader begins to understand Mr. Bessel's interpretation of the first part of this strange story. The being whose frantic rush through London had inflicted so much injury and disaster had indeed Mr. Bessel's body. But it was not Mr. Bessel. It was an evil spirit out of that strange world beyond existence into which Mr. Bessel had so rashly ventured. For twenty hours it held possession of him, and for all those twenty hours the dispossessed spirit body of Mr. Bessel was going to and fro in that unheard-of middle world of shadows seeking help in vain. He spent many hours beating at the minds of Mr. Vincey and of his friend Mr. Hart. Each, as we know, he roused by his efforts, but the language that might convey his situation to these helpers across the gulf he did not know. His feeble fingers groped vainly and powerlessly in their brains. Once, indeed, as we have already told, he was able to turn Mr. Vincey aside from his patch so that he encountered the stolen body in its career. But he could not make him understand a thing that had happened. He was unable to draw any help from that encounter. All through these hours the persuasion was overwhelming in Mr. Bessel's mind that presently his body would be killed by its furious tenant, and he would have to remain in this shadow land for evermore so that those long hours were a growing agony of fear. And ever as he hurried to and fro in his ineffectual excitement, innumerable spirits of that world about him mobbed him and confused his mind. And ever an envious, applauding multitude poured after their successful fellow as he went upon his glorious career. For that, it would seem, must be the life of these bodiless things of this world that is the shadow of our world. Ever they watch coveting a way into a mortal body, in order that they may descend as furies and frenzies, as violent lusts and mad, strange impulses, rejoicing in the body they have won. For Mr. Bessel was not the only human soul in that place. Witness the fact that he met first one and afterwards several shadows of men, men like himself, it seemed, who had lost their bodies, even it may be as he had lost his, and wandered despairingly in that lost world that is neither life nor death. They could not speak because the world is silent, yet he knew them for men because of their dim human bodies and because of the sadness of their faces. But how they had come into that world he could not tell, nor where the bodies they had lost might be, whether they still raved about the earth or whether they were closed forever in death against return. That they were the spirits of the dead neither he nor I believe, but Dr. Wilson Paget thinks they are the rational souls of men who are lost in madness on the earth. At last Mr. Bessel chanced upon a place where a little crowd of such disembodied silent creatures was gathered, and thrusting through them he saw below a brightly lit room, and four or five quiet gentlemen and a woman, a stoutish woman, dressed in black bombazine and sitting awkwardly in a chair with a head thrown back. He knew her from her portraits to be Mrs. Bullock the medium, and he perceived that tracts and structures in her brain glowed and stirred as he had seen the pineal eye in the brain of Mr. Vincey glow. The light was very fitful. Sometimes it was a broad illumination, and sometimes merely a faint twilight spot. And it shifted slowly about her brain. She kept on talking and writing with one hand, and Mr. Bessel saw that the crowding shadows of men about him, and a great multitude of shadow spirits of that shadow land, were all striving and thrusting to touch the lighted regions of her brain. As one gained her brain, or another was thrust away, her voice and the writing of her hand changed so that what she said was disorderly and confused for the most part. Now a fragment of one soul's message, and now a fragment of another's, and now she babbled the insane fancies of the spirits of vain desire. Then Mr. Bessel understood that she spoke for the spirit that had touched of her, and he began to struggle very furiously towards her. But he was on the outside of the crowd, and at that time he could not reach her, and at last, growing anxious, he went away to find what had happened meanwhile to his body. For a long time he went to and fro, seeking it in vain and fearing that it must have been killed. And then he found it at the bottom of the shaft in Baker Street, writhing furiously and cursing with pain. Its leg and arm and two ribs had been broken by its fall. 
Moreover, the evil spirit was angry, because his time had been so short, and because of the pain making violent movements and casting his body about. And at that Mr. Bessel returned with redoubled earnestness to the room where the seance was going on, and so soon as he had thrust himself within sight of the place, he saw one of the men who stood about the medium looking at his watch as if he meant that the seance should presently end. And that a great number of the shadows who had been striving turned away with gestures of despair. But a thought that the seance was almost over only made Mr. Bessel the more earnest, and he struggled so stoutly with his will against the others that presently he gained the woman's brain. It chanced that just at that moment it glowed very brightly, and in that instant she wrote the message that Dr. Wilson Paget preserved. And then the other shadows and the cloud of evil spirits about him had thrust Mr. Bessel away from her, and for all the rest of the seance he could regain her no more. So he went back and watched through the long hours at the bottom of the shaft where the evil spirit lay in the stolen body it had maimed, writhing and cursing and weeping and groaning and learning the lessons of pain. And towards dawn the thing he had waited for happened, the brain glowed brightly and the evil spirit came out and Mr. Bessel entered the body he had feared he should never enter again. As he did so, the silence, the brooding silence, ended. He heard the tumult of traffic and the voices of people overhead, and that strange world that is the shadow of our world, the dark and silent shadows of ineffectual desire, and the shadows of lost men vanished clean away. He lay there for the space of about three hours before he was found, and in spite of the pain and suffering of his wounds, and of the dim, damp place in which he lay, in spite of the tears wrung from him by his physical distress, his heart was full of gladness to know that he was nevertheless back once more in the kindly world of men. End of The Stolen Body 